On the opposite of me is sitting uh, Beth Povinelli. She is a cultural anthropologist at Columbia University. And uh, she has made a very interesting movie. And I think the, in the movie itself is very interesting. But most interestingly uh, is also the story how she came to it. Um, Beth, can you maybe tell us the title of the movie and also how you got the I initial idea for this film? Uh, the title of the movie is Karabing, Low Tide Turning. Um, yeah. Karabing is an Emmy Engel word that uh, refers to when the tides at its lowest and in English that can seem have a negative connotation like low tide but actually in Emmy Angle it's this fabulous moment because when the tide goes way out which it does up in North Australia all kinds of paths open up so you can actually walk to islands across <coughs> reefs. Um, the film came, uh, the idea of the film came from the Karabing themselves which are a group of uh, uh, indigenous uh, men and women who I've known since they were about eight and ten and I was about 22 um, so about 28 years now um, and they wanted to uh, tell a story about um, the everyday experience of being poor um, uh, and indigenous in Australia um, uh, focusing on really the 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 ordinary aspects of uh, the struggle to get a project going to get life uh, just turn pages of life every day um, rather than on anything spectacular which uh, they find really takes away from um, how it is to be indigenous. The, the real picture, right? And I think yeah. what is most interestingly, what you told me is that you went to Australia just on a trip oh, yeah. and as a coincidence you run into those people that were busy with filing a land claim yeah. and then they needed an anthropologist and you said that's a problem because I'm a philosopher. I'm an <laughs> undergrad <laughs> in uh, philosophy and then kind of so you have influenced their story right now with your film but initially it started with a big influence on your life because you continued Right. Uh, with a study in anthropology, that's is right. that right, right? That's right. That's absolutely right. I was a, uh, I was an undergraduate in philosophy um, and the great books philosophy, and I went to Australia um, on a little fellowship. Though I didn't know what I was doing, I wound up in a small indigenous community named Bell Ewan. They were engaged in one of the longest and most contentious land claims in Australia. Um, mm. And by law, they needed two kinds of representatives. They needed a lawyer or an anthropologist. And after a year there, uh, they looked at me, they were very funny, and they said, you seem solid enough, which yeah. meant I was strong. And they said, you seem smart enough, which meant I was not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, we need a lawyer. Why don't you be our lawyer? And I yeah. said, I've spent my entire life, I was only 22, but spent my entire <laughs> life yeah. not becoming a lawyer. And they said, well, what about anthropologist? So I went to graduate school in anthropology to go back and actually help them run the claim. And what you say is really right. Um, these, this very long friendship, and it's now you know three generations long, um, has not only shaped the kind of work I do, but it's shaped the kind of person I am. Um, and I think hopefully people can see how you can get a a sense of intimacy on film when you actually are working with people you've known for a very, very long time. Yeah, I, I can totally imagine that. And in knowing the film, it's a story where uh, it, it starts actually in a house. People are renting a house, but then their main goal is they have to find the house owner mm. uh, with little and no money because otherwise they are kind of like pushed out of the house on the streets. So you see this visual circle. Um, that with no money and being, you know, a minority in mm. your country, that there's mm. little hope, um, you know, to get on the right track and to improve your life for the better. Um, what is interesting in your film is that there's a big lifesaver that the mm. people seem to have. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yeah, sure. Oh, just to give <laughs> viewers a little background, um, in, in the North today, uh, the, the government... Um, is trying to get indigenous people out of their homelands f for various reasons. One is they want to exploit resources in them. So they're trying to push indigenous people in the cities, but they're not providing any housing in the cities. Mm -hmm. So everyone ends up 
crowding into these government houses um, and then the bureaucracy comes and says you're overcrowding you're losing your house and then they become homeless if they try and go back to their country yeah which we show in the film them as they try and find this woman they go back to their outstation uh, the government's removed all the infrastructure so there's no toilets <laughs> there's no houses you can live in tents you create water um, so on the one hand you think what a depressing movie uh, it's hopeless. You can't be in the city, you can't be in the country, you can't be anywhere. But the Karabing are a extraordinarily resilient, uh, really kind of funny group. They take extraordinary pleasure in each other's foibles and how people, everybody has their own little character. Um, so the movie is, has, hopefully people will see that it has great joy and great humor even as it maintains or moves back and forth in mood so you also have moments in which you think right this could be exhausting yeah um so it's, it's a reality picture but at the same yeah. time a kind of i can imagine like with many films you had the bedding now it's kind of a learning lesson for all of us mm. um you, you appreciate your own situation m for the better. Yeah. And also, if anything negative comes along the side, positive energy and, and, and you know, like a lot of perseverance is helping to cope with a lot That's of right. things. That's right. That's so right. That's right. And, you know, one of the things that the Karabing thinks about, and I think about, of course, as well, is how do you, um, how do you activate that kind of resilience, that kind mm -hmm. of humor in a in a person and they think about it they they think well we have it and we try and cultivate that amongst ourselves like being serious when it matters to be serious but also being light and taking pleasure in each other even in these moments in which you just would rather just go sit down and maybe have a beer mm -hmm. um, and that's the real question is like how do you get folks to see even in these moments of stress and difficulty that there that one can still find pleasure in each other and pleasure in the kind of moving along as we're trying to do something yeah um, but I think you know I think that's right a lot of times you just see the negative or you just see the positive and neither one of them captures the full emotional range of what it means yeah. to live in these spaces Wow, and how do you, would you have any explanation uh, about the Caribbean, like from an anthropology point of view, <laughs> or <laughs> am I going too deep right now? <laughs> I mean, we, I we mean, can I'm show this interview <laughs> to all your students, you know, at yeah, Columbia yeah. University. <laughs> it can be a case study. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> um, many people consider, consider me a, a funny anthropologist. On the one hand, I appear yeah. to be very classical anthropologist. Like, you know, I, I actually, for 28 years, have been going back and forth, same, you know, my who are now my dear friends for, I go back two, three times a year. We really have grown up with each other. You know, I live in the outback. Uh, so in some ways, it would be, I would be a classical anthropologist. Yeah. But in other ways, I'm, I'm really not. Uh, yeah. uh, these are deep friendships. These are deep obligations that sometimes when I'm talking, I was talking to one of my sisters there, Killigine, mm. and I was just frustrated one day. And I said, I'm never coming back. I'm yeah. never, <laughs> ever coming back. I've had it. I don't know what we were doing. We were pissing each other off. <laughs> and she looked at me in a kind of blase way, and she said, yes, you will. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. Never coming back. Yeah. She said, yes, you will. Because if you were going to actually leave you would yeah. have done it about 20 years ago we're all uh, stuck with each other yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like meant to be right no, <laughs> meant to be uh, this uh, is but no the question about from an anthropological point of view why yeah. um why do these particular people have this kind kind of resilience that is the de that's where anthropology and philosophy meet for me because you can talk about a certain cultural attitude toward uh, about how you tell very difficult uh, stories on very difficult topics and the local way of doing that is to move with great humor then 
fall into seriousness and just when you think you can't take the serious any seriousness anymore pop up back into humor again and you see that this narrative strategy allows listeners to hear real issues without feeling defeated because they know that you're going to kind of pop back up into humor but yeah. but you've still heard the horrible thing yeah you're just relieved of the pain of it so there there i would say there was a cultural issue but then there's the philosophical issue that is there are many many family members who are not part of Karabing who do not have this resilience in humor yeah. who have fallen by the wayside um, and so the philosophical question about why this person rather than that person um, has that capacity you know that's a, it's a it's a whole set of other questions come into play I guess. yeah you just it's, it's there, lucky they have like it professor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely definitely i'm going to follow a class at columbia right now oh, <laughs> you know i'm very interested in, in your topics uh, as usual but um so if people like to is is there any news already about where the film will be distributed or can they email you or yeah or absolutely get in people touch should, with you people we're talking to some distributors um This is our world premiere. Uh, yeah. We've been invited to submit to Toronto, but we're just, we literally just finished the film about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, we're hoping, actually, uh, for anybody who's interested in helping fund us, um, yeah. the, their vision is to make uh, four or five shorts yeah. that look at this group's attempt to make an augmented reality project from different perspectives. So one would start in the bush, this one started in the city, one would start in the bush, one would start inside a, uh, a, bu a bureaucratic agency, like, uh, you know, work for the dole kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and you would, s you would come to understand the whole life story of a, a group of indigenous people trying to get a project going and what kinds of ordinary obstacles lie in their path. Wow, I, I think that's a very interesting idea because uh, to work with a group like the Karabi with uh, augmented reality features, yeah. I think that has never been done. I don't think uh, so. We're even hoping we can play it and uh, actually play the film in locations with the, on your... I don't your, hate to, yeah, I won't uh, do the branding. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I just did. <laughs> I think it can be National Geographic project no. or, or <laughs> uh, somewhere. No, I mean it's your project, but I mean it has it has yeah. definitely a lot of uh, exposure opportunities. Yeah, no, uh, I'm sure, so. like many channels, will be interested in yeah. that. So I look forward to all the Thank future, you, um, you know, um, projects that ca are coming out of this. And I wish you, you lots of success. And I hope to see you uh, to talk uh, with your next project about augmented reality uh, in another interview. Thank no, you so totally much. No, totally right on. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.